indictment on Israel genocide charges expected on Friday. Russian military transport plane down at Kiev border. Good afternoon and Salam Malaysia Madani. I'm Sahih Samshuddin and you're watching World Today. Judges at the International Court of Justice ICJ will rule on Friday whether or not they will grant emergency measures against Israel following accusations by South Africa that the Israel military operation in Gaza is a state-led genocide. A South African government delegation had touched down in The Hague in anticipation of the judgment. The United Nations top court issued a statement on Wednesday saying the 17-judge panel will hand down its ruling in court on January 26 at 12 o'clock. Earlier this month, in two days of hearing, South Africa asked the ICJ, also known as the World Court, to order an emergency suspension of Israel's devastating military campaign in the Palestine enclave. While the court is expected to rule on possible emergency measures, it will not rule at the same time on the genocide allegations as those proceedings could take years. The ruling, if granted, would probably take the form of an order to Israel to announce a ceasefire in Gaza and allow more UN humanitarian aid into the country. Israel dismissed the genocide allegations as grossly distorted and said it had a right to defend itself and was targeting Hamas and not Palestinian civilians. Russia yesterday accused Ukraine of shooting down a military transport plane carrying dozens of Ukrainian detainees headed for a prisoner exchange, killing everyone on board. Kiev confirmed a prisoner swap was due to occur Wednesday, but several hours after the crash said it still had no reliable information on the passengers as President Volodymyr Zelensky called for an international investigation. Videos on social media showed a large plane in Russia's western Belgorod region falling from the sky on its side before crashing in a fireball. Russia's defense ministry said the IL-76 plane was carrying 65 Ukrainian soldiers captured in Russia's offensive as well as six crew and three escorts. It claimed Ukrainian forces stationed in the Kharkiv border region had fired two missiles at a transport aircraft and described the incident as a terrorist act. Ukraine's main intelligence agency said in a statement that they do not have reliable or comprehensive information on the crash. But Ukrainian media initially cited defense sources saying Ukraine's army had downed the plane and that it was carrying missiles. The claim was later retracted. In a carefully worded statement published after the crash, the Ukrainian army said it would continue to target Russian aircraft in Belgorod region. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz said on Wednesday that the aim of European Union's special summit next week is for all EU member states to agree to financial aid for Ukraine. Scholz told reporters during a joint press conference with Slovakian Prime Minister Robert Fico in Berlin that he hoped to find a solution with 27 member states. Fico underlined that Slovakia would agree with the plan and not put any obstacles, even though he did not believe that the conflict could be resolved militarily. A German government spokesperson said earlier on Wednesday that additional weapons deliveries to Ukraine to help it battle Russian invasion will be a topic of discussion during the summit. Scholes had urged EU allies in early January to step up their military aid to Ukraine. Unser Gespräch heute werden wir auch nutzen, um das nächste Treffen des Europäischen Rates in Brüssel kommende Woche vorzubereiten. Es geht darum, Finanzhilfen der Europäischen Union für die Ukraine zu beschließen. Sie kennen die Lage. Unser Ziel ist es, eine gemeinsame Vereinbarung aller EU-Staaten im Rahmen der Revision des EU-Finanzrahmens hinzubekommen, damit 50 Milliarden Euro in den nächsten vier Jahren an Krediten und Zuschüssen für Kiew verlässlich zur Verfügung stehen. Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi arrived in Turkish capital Ankara on Wednesday for talks with his Turkish counterpart Recep Tayyip Erdogan to discuss the widening conflict in Gaza and energy cooperation between the two neighbours. 
The Turkish presidency said on Tuesday that the two leaders will also chair a Turkish-Iranian business council and that some agreements could be signed. Meanwhile, Energy Minister Alpaslan Bakretar said he had discussed energy cooperation with Iranian oil minister Javad Oji during talks in Ankara. Turkey, which supports a two-state solution to the decades-old Israeli-Palestinian conflict, has harshly criticised Israel for its attacks on Gaza, called for an immediate ceasefire, and backed legal step for Israel to be tried for genocide. Iran leads what it calls the Axis of Resistance, a loose coalition that includes Hamas and armed Muslim groups around the region that have military confronted Israel and its Western allies. It has even voiced support for Hamas. Iran's hardline Guardian Council has banned former pragmatist President Hassan Rouhani from standing again in an election in March for the Assembly of Experts which appoints and can dismiss the Supreme Leader according to state media reports on Wednesday. The 88-member assembly, founded in 1982, supervises the most powerful authority but has rarely intervened directly in policymaking. Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei is 84, so the new assembly is expected to play a significant role in choosing his successor since its members are only elected every eight years. Close to moderates, Rouhani was elected president in a landslide in 2013 and 2017 on a promise to reduce Iran's diplomatic isolation. However, the mid-ranking cleric angered political hardliners who opposed any reapproachment with the US after reaching a 2015 nuclear pact with six major powers. The deal unraveled in 2018 when then United States President Donald Trump ditched the agreement and reimposed sanctions that have crippled Iran's economy. Efforts to revive the pact have failed. Ecuador's President Daniel Noboa met with Spain's Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez on Wednesday in Madrid. It was his first international destination since he declared an internal armed conflict in his country earlier this month. Ecuador is reeling from a wave of violence that has shaken the South American nation with Noboa launching a military crackdown on gangs and a 60-day state of emergency. Incidents this month have included the interruption of a live television broadcast by gunmen, the taking of more than 200 prison staff as hostages, explosion in several cities, and the kidnapping of police officers leading to the widespread security force operations and nearly 2,000 arrests. Before meeting Sanchez, Noboa attended Fitur, an international trade fair in the Spanish capital where he told media that it was very hard to leave. According to him, however, Ecuador had to face the world and show how things are improving and invite people to invest and visit Ecuador. Thousands of people walk off the job in Buenos Aires on Wednesday as part of a strike planned by trade unions to protest the austerity policies of President Javier Millet. Argentina's largest union started a 12-hour strike on Wednesday and a major demonstration in the heart of Buenos Aires. The action hitting sectors from transportation to banks is the biggest show of opposition to Millet's plan for spending cuts and privatisation since he took office last month, pledging to fix an economy reeling from 211% inflation and crippling debt. The strike, coordinated by the powerful Umbrella Union, the General Confederation of Labour, CGT, comes amid major scrutiny of Millet's two major reform pushes, his omnibus bill going through Congress and a mega decree deregulating the economy. Millet, an economist and former television pundit who pulled off a shock election win last year, is balancing stabilising the South American country's economy and reducing a deep fiscal deficit with a painful cost of living crisis and poverty running at more than 40%. Coming up next, GM to invest over $1.4 billion in Brazil. Stay tuned. British billionaire Joe Louis pleaded guilty to United States insider trading charges on Wednesday after being accused last year of a scheme that prosecutors said was designed to enrich friends and associates and apologised to a judge for his conduct.
Louis, 86, pleaded guilty to one count of conspiracy to commit securities fraud and two counts of securities fraud under an agreement with the U.S. Attorney's Office in Manhattan. As part of the plea deal, Louis can appeal if the judge in the case sentences him to prison time, his lawyer David Zorno said. Sentencing was scheduled for March 28. Lewis, whose family trust controls a majority of the Tottenham Hotspur football team, was charged in July 2023 with passing inside information on his portfolio companies to two of his private pilots as well as friends, personal assistants and romantic partners, enabling them, according to prosecutors, to reap millions of dollars of profit. Lewis was charged by federal prosecutors with 16 counts of securities fraud and three counts of conspiracy for conduct that occurred from 2013 to 2021. While Lewis will not plead guilty to other counts of under the terms of his deal, Clark said she may consider them for sentencing purposes. General Motors said Wednesday it will invest more than 1.4 billion US dollars in Brazil in the next five years to develop electric vehicle production in Latin America's biggest economy. After meeting President Luis Inácio Lula da Silva in Brasilia, the US auto giant's president for international operations, Silpan Amin, said the future is all electric. Lula, whose administration has pushed out auto companies in Brazil to make electric cars locally rather than import them, welcomed the announcement. The veteran leftist wrote on X, formerly Twitter, this comes at a great time worth the return of Brazilian economic growth. GM currently imports all electric vehicles sold in Brazil. Lula also met Wednesday with representative of Chinese electric vehicle maker BYD, which is planning to build a $600 million plant in Bahia State in northeastern Brazil. Electric and hybrid vehicles remain rare in Brazil, a major oil producer. According to industry group ABVE, but sales increased by 91% last year. Germany's chemical sector, Europe's largest, is starting to feel the pinch from delayed shipments via the Red Sea, becoming the latest industry to warn of supply disruptions that have forced some companies to curb production. Crucial Asian imports to Europe ranging from car parts and engineering equipment to chemicals and toys are currently taking longer to arrive as container shippers have diverted vessels around Africa and away from the Red Sea and Swiss Canal following attacks by the Yemen's Houthis. While the German industry has got used to supply disruptions in the wake of the pandemic and Ukraine war, the impact of reduced traffic via the trade artery is starting to show with Tesla's Berlin factory the most prominent victim so far. Germany's chemical sector, the country's third biggest industry after cars and engineering, with annual sales of around 260 billion euros, relies on Asia for around a third of its imports from outside Europe. As a result of the delays, Gacha, which makes annual sales in the double gin millions of euros, has lowered production of dishwasher and toilet tablets because it cannot get enough trisodium, citrate, as well as sulfamic and citric acid. The company is therefore reviewing its three shift system, adding the ripple effects from the transport squeeze could remain a problem for the first half of 2024 at least. Egypt's sovereign wealth fund is finalising a master plan to revamp Cairo's historic centre now that government ministries have largely moved to a new capital to the east and hopes to break ground on the project within months, its chief executive said. The area model on Paris in the 1860s is filled with elegant but crumbling buildings constructed over the subsequent seven decades. Many were nationalised in the 1950s and 1960s and left in disrepair. The Sovereign Fund has already taken control of three prime properties in central Cairo and received ownership of 11 former ministry buildings in a decree published this week in the official Gazette. The blueprint includes the government's quarter on the southern edge of downtown and involves traffic plans, area surveys and plans to repurpose various buildings. The European Bank for Reconstruction and Development and two international advisors are helping to draw it up. The fund expects to take over many former government buildings to either sell, manage on behalf of the government or turn over to private developers in exchange for a minority ownership stake in the projects. The plan will discourage some activities such as warehousing and storage while encouraging others such as tourism. 
60 Syrian migrants were rescued from a small boat off Cyprus on Wednesday after being stranded at sea for days, including three children and a man who were found unconscious on board. According to Cypriot authorities, the Joint Rescue Coordination Centre of Larnaca rescuers had lifted what they said is a baby from a Coast Guard vessel onto a helicopter. Authorities scramble rescue helicopters and patrol vessels after a merchant vessel reported seeing a small wooden fishing boat about 30 nautical miles off Cape Greco, Cyprus' most southeasterly point. Cyprus Joint Rescue Coordination Centre said all the migrants were taken to hospital, including the four found unconscious and three who had lower limb fractures. Officials said they were all dehydrated. At another time, police vessel provided first aid while another boat and two helicopters were mobilised to transport the critical patients and injured to hospital. Officials further said that the occupants of the boat, or Syrians, had sailed from Lebanon on 18 January. Lebanon's coastline is about 168 kilometres from Cyprus. Harimau Malaya ready for a final act in the Asian Cup against South Korea. That and more next in sports. With nothing much to play for except pride, the final Group E match of the 2023 Asian Cup against South Korea will at least provide the Harimau Malaya players with a priceless experience. The match at the Al Janoub Stadium will be the first time after 44 years that these two teams will go toe-to-toe -to -toe in the group stage of the Asian Cup. While excited at the prospect of guiding Malaysia to take on South Korea, his country of birth and one of the giants in the Asian region, national head coach Kim Pang Gon admitted that his team of coaches have done all they can to leave the pall of gloom that had descended on the national team camp after their two earlier Group E losses consigned them to another early group exit. We will nothing lost, but I depend on our performance and our yeah, depend on situation. We may get something uh, for the momentum or, or, or something, a uh, foundation for the future preparation. So for us, very important. For us, very important. Uh, we face we face a World Cup qualification uh, this moment, uh, maybe coming uh, March and June. And uh, if we go to success, to go to final stage, we may face this kind of uh, such giant football country, Korea, maybe Japan, Iran. Meanwhile, national centre-back Dion Kuls is also excited about tonight's match despite the disappointment of missing out on the round of 16. I think these are the kind of games you want to play. This is the kind of games you dream of. So. I think all of us have enough motivation tomorrow to, to perform well, to do our best uh, and give it all. I think it's a very nice experience for us as a team to, to gain this experience, so uh, we will do our best. This is the second time Malaysia and South Korea will meet in the group stage of the Asian Cup after both teams drew 1-1 in the 1980 edition in Kuwait with striker Zulkilfi Hamza netting the equaliser. The last time these two teams met in a competitive match ended with Malaysia losing 3-0 to South Korea in the World Cup qualifiers in 1989. Japan beat Indonesia 3-1 in their final Asian Cup Group D game last night to guarantee a top two finish and qualify for the last 16, while Iraq went top with maximum points when they seal a 3-2 win over Vietnam with a 102nd minute winner. The Feyenoord striker put the four-time champions in control early on when he opened the scoring in the sixth minute from a penalty kick after he was wrestled to the ground by Indonesian captain Jordi Amat. In the seventh minute of the second half, Yuda found the net once more, capping off an orchestrated team play starting with Takahiro Tomiyasu feeding Ritsu Don in the midfield. Don the sprinted through the centre, receiving a world time return pass from Kento Nakamura to set up Yuda with the simplest of finishes at the far post. 
Indonesian defender Justin Hamner scored an own goal in the 87th minute before his compatriot Sandy Wall struck at the other end a minute into at the time. The result saw Japan finish three points behind Iraq, who emerged as group champion after collecting maximum points by edging Vietnam 3-2 in another match, while Indonesia took third place and will have to wait for the conclusion of the group phase tomorrow to determine if they will advance to the last 16. Meanwhile, Iraq emerged victorious in a thrilling encounter against Vietnam at the Jassim bin Hamad with striker Ayman Hussein coming off from the bench and scoring a brace to help the Lions of Mesopotamia maintain its winning record in the campaign. Vietnam thought they had secured the lead in the 17th minute when Iraqi defender Zaid Tassin inadvertently netted an own goal while attempting to clear Vo Min Trong's cross. However, VR intervention nullified the goal. The deadlock was eventually broken in the 40th minute when Bai Hong Viet An scored a well placed volley from Kwad Vak Hang's free kick before the Golden Star Warriors faced a setback just before half time as Kwad Van Hang received a second yellow card, reducing them to 10 players. Eager to capitalize on the advantage, Iraq manager Jesus Kassas introduced forwards Ali Jassim and Ayman Hussein at the start of the second half with saw an immediate impact as defender Rubin Solaka headed his first international goal from Jassim's corner kick to level the score in the 47th minute. Hussein secured Iraq's second goal by heading in a cross from Jassim for his fourth goal of the campaign in the 73rd minute before his spot kick in the 83rd minute was denied by the woodwork. Vietnam, led by Philippe Trouzier, managed to equalise in the first minute of stoppage time through substitute Nguyen Quang Hai, but it was heartbreak for the Southeast Asian side when a last-minute penalty conceded by Vo Min Trong allowed Hussein to secure Iraq's winning goal. In tennis, Germany's Alexander Zverev stunned second seed Carlos Alcaraz to reach the Australian Open semi final as his subline display of serving took him to a 6 1, 6 3, 6 7, 6 4 victory on Wednesday. Zarev made a flying start on Rod Labour Arena, dropping just two points on serve as he raced through the opening set. The sixth seed was rock solid to keep an unusually subdued Alcaraz at arm's length and broke serve twice in the second set as Ares leaked off the Spanish record. The pattern continued in the third set as the German maintained an incredibly high level but he faulted for the first time when serving for the match and Alcaraz played an astonishing tiebreak to prolong the contest. A fired up Alcaraz seemed to have the momentum in his fourth set, but a tiring Zverev dug deep to stay with the Spaniard and broke serve at 4 4 before closing out his first ever win against a top five ranked opponent in a Grand Slam. He will face Russian Daniel Medvedev in tomorrow's semi final. In the women's row, Zhang Kinwen shook off its sluggish start to our class Russian Anna Kalinskaya 6-7, 6-3, 6-1 and reached the semi-finals of the Australian Open for the first time while the Chinese 12th seed will take on Ukrainian qualifier Diana Yastremska. Kalinskaya appeared nervous in the first Grand Slam quarterfinal as she gifted the opening break of the match with double fourth but Zeng returned the favour immediately and the duo were locked until the tie break after more shaky displays on serve. US Open quarter finalist Zhang came under pressure when she hit a forehand wide to hand Kalinskaya two opportunities to take the opening set and the Russian finished it with a big backhand. But Zhang broke her 25-year-old opponent for a 5-3 lead the next before leveling the contest at one set apiece playing top quality tennis and pounced again without losing a point in the third game of the decided to pull away for the victory. With the countdown to the Paris 2024 Summer Games is six months away, Olympic venues in Paris, but also in other parts of France and Tahiti are getting ready to welcome the world's biggest sporting event held from 26 July to 11th August. Paris will have 15 competition venues for the Olympic Games and will host 21 of the 32 Olympic sports in and around some of its most iconic monuments. 
France capital, home to 2.1 million inhabitants, will also showcase its world-famous architecture, art and history to the millions of people expected to attend events at the Games. On the Champ de Mars, a world-famous garden at the foot of the Eiffel Tower, beach volleyball competition will be held, providing an opportunity to watch the sun set while athletes compete. On the River Seine, thousands of athletes will parade in boats on 24th July for the traditional opening ceremony while hundreds of thousands of people will line the banks. The Seine will also play host to swimmers during the Trial Tron and open water swimming events, the first time it has been deemed safe to swim since Paris last hosted the Games 100 years ago in 1924. The Olympics will bring together 10,500 Olympic athletes from 206 countries. Well, just weeks later, Paris will play host to 4,400 Paralympic athletes. Events will be watched by more than 13 million spectators and 4 billion television viewers across the world, totaling 100,000 hours of TV broadcasting. In motorsports, the World Rally Championship begins its search for a new king on today when the season-opening Monte Carlo event starts with our champion Carl Robin Perra. The Finn, who had just turned 23rd, I'm sorry, just turned 23 when he won his second straight world title for Toyota last October, has opted to follow the example of the team's elder statesman Sebastian Ogier and race part-time. Toyota, who has swept the top category the last three seasons, are again one of three manufacturers in the elite category. Ford will run two cars, Hyundai will run three and Toyota will enter four, but the last will not score points in the Manufacturers' Championship. Toyota keep Alfin Evans, last season's runner-up, and Takamoto Katsuta, as well as the two deluxe part-timers, eight-time champion Ogie, who drove in eight of the 13 rallies last year, and Rovan Perra. The 40-year-old Ogie won a record nine Monte Carlo rally last year. With Rovan Perra skipping the event, the road seems clear for Evans, runner-up in the three of the last four seasons to chase a first title. Pierre-Louis Loubet had dropped to WRC2, while former champion Ot Tanak has switched back to Hyundai. The Korean mark, still chasing their first driver's world title, also welcomed back Finn Andreas Mikkelsen from WRC2 alongside Belgian Thierry Neuville, a five-time title runner-up. And that wraps up this edition of World Today. Now, top story, World Court ruling on Israel genocide charges expected on Friday. I'm Saeed Samshuddin. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Thanks for tuning in.